Yes, so welcome. I'm hoping everybody's logged in. So this is part of our COVID-19 and MS series. And this is actually a very important topic. If you follow social media and the issues on social media, one of the things that's really bubbling up is this anticipation of a vaccine and will our patients be vaccine ready, we call the term, and will they be able to respond to the vaccine? So I've got my scientific partner, Professor David Baker, who is a uh, EAEologist, a mouse doctor, and he's going to give you the background in terms of the immunology, what's required to respond to the vaccine and what vaccines are coming out. And then I will uh, spend the second half just complementing it with some case studies uh, around the issues of vaccination. So David, off you go. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or wherever you are. Um, so just, uh, I guess, my disclaimers. Uh, my name's uh, David Baker. I um, am not a neurologist, and I'm not clinically qualified. And I did make the slides myself. Uh, and I don't think any of my uh, disclosures are really that relevant. OK, so what I want to really do to talk today is really talk about uh, a bit about COVID-19. I know you're probably sick of it by now. but. Um, we need to kind of talk about what is pathology and then we need to talk about what are the immunity mechanisms because that is then relevant when we think about what are the pathways to uh, vaccination. And um, if you then can understand that, I then think you can then uh, decide how these may be relevant for the different uh, disease modifying treatments and for multiple sclerosis in general. So many of the things that I'm going to say today actually have kind of are out there on the web now. So we wrote a review um, um, when this thing started to come out. And uh, this is kind of gives you our take about the immunity and the background behind it. And this was submitted prior to any idea about what was actually going to happen in the future. So um, bear that in mind when um, you read it. But it, it will give you the background um, if you're interested. So uh, the question is, is what is coronavirus? Uh, um, it's actually COVID-19. It's caused by the uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, um, which seemed to have jumped from bats, possibly via pangolins into humans. And it's causing a, a lethal, devastating disease, which is killing a, an awful lot of uh, people in the, in, in the world. So it infects via the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And there are a few others, but um, that's by the by. And generally what happens is there's a pre-symptomatic period of uh, about five days and then three, three weeks, up to three weeks. And then people get disease, but many people actually are asymptomatic. And that's probably maybe between 50 to 80%, depending on which publication you want to read. Um, now, the other thing is, is these in, uh, asymptomatic people will uh, give off virus and that may be up for you know seven weeks or more so you know bear that in mind when you're thinking about how you socially distance uh, in some individuals people get symptomatic and they the thing that we've, we got worried about first of all was the acute respiratory distress, uh, distress syndrome causing uh, the lung issues but uh, obviously I think we were learning a lot more and there is a vascular pathology which actually is important um, People uh, get tested and they're generally tested by PCR as we'll come on to. Some people go negative and come back again. And the question is, is that reinfection or not? And we'll discuss that in a little bit. And when you do get infected, generally most people then make an antibody response and that can be detected for at least for a few months. So that's the good news because obviously the tests aren't available widely. And so we don't know if we've been infected or not. So what is um, SARS-CoV-2? Well, uh, it's an RNA virus made up of 29 proteins. And the major protein, um, called the spike protein, there are four structural proteins, uh, is a target for infection. And then there's a nucleocapsid protein, which kind of protects the, uh, the RNA inside the viral particle. And then there's a whole host of uh, non-structural um, proteins. And they have different functions, and some of them we don't really understand what they do. Some make pores into the nucleus. Then there's clearly the viral replication machinery, which there are a number of different proteins involved in that. And um, then there's also the formation of like the viral bubble, and that essentially then gives rise to the uh, envelope protein and the membrane protein, or the matrix protein, depending on what you want to call it. And that creates a viral particle which houses the RNA. And um, then there are also um, proteins produced that actually suppress the immune system. Um, 
that allow the virus to escape uh, um, uh, immune elimination early on. And then there are uh, membrane proteins that um, allow the uh, virus to escape. Now, in terms of uh, a vaccine, you know, most of our thoughts have really been focused around a few proteins, and it's largely the structural protein, the spike protein, and the nucleocapsid. Not to say that some of these other proteins couldn't be important uh, for viral detection or potentially for to be targets, but obviously the uh, external proteins are the particularly the spike protein. So we have the viral A, the nu nu nucleocapsid, and then we have the, uh, the envelope and the membrane protein making the particle. And then we have the spike protein, and that gives it the crown-like structure, which is why it's called a coronavirus. And generally, when this is made, it, it's formed as a trimer. And um, the important thing is that there's an, an a region called the uh, receptor binding domain, and that's critical for the virus binding to its target, the uh, ACE2 uh, enzyme. And that allows um, the, the virus to start to infect the cell. And of course, that means it's important when we think about um, vaccines that that is, if you're thinking about neutralization, that has got to be the target. Now, in terms of um, detecting the virus, um, one can look for the um, things such as nucleocapsid. Here's an example of a test, not a, a, a licensed test, showing um, uh, a number of people pre pre 18 showing low levels and then you can then detect uh, this using different uh, technologies and the important point is here that it's probably after you're about two weeks after symptom onset is that's when most people become positive uh, uh, before then then many people may be negative and the other thing that is has been increasingly evident is if you have an immune response to the um, um, receptor binding domain on the spike polycule, that's what gives you the neutralization potential to stop it infecting any more cells. So if you're thinking about a vaccine, that's kind of what you want to target. So why are we worried about um, the, the vaccine? Well, I think, um, and, and actually COVID, and that's because of what happened when we first started seeing COVID. And that was because we noticed that the immune response uh, was being uh, hammered. So the, the uh, lymphocyte levels were lymphopenic and that gave us a, a, a fear that uh, you know people who had severe disease had had lymphopenia and therefore was it a cause and effect and clearly with MS drugs they can potentially cause lymphopenia and therefore that was the worry. Now it's quite clear that if you have MS you've got an increased risk of uh, infection that's a small risk and if you're on a DMT then you've got an increased risk and that that's got to be biology because at the end of the day we think the immune system targets um, uh, MS to make create the MS and likewise uh, it's there to block infection so if you get rid of parts of the immune system that you will have an increased risk of infection that's kind of that's biology and then I guess the question is the higher and more uh, efficacious you become at blocking the immune system the more likely you are to have side effects so that kind of is the backdrop and then clearly that's why we were more, more concerned with the more high efficacious agents which are depleting agents and uh, that they may be more may be associated with more problems. And we certainly know that um, lipopenia is, is, is associated with a, an increased risk of infection. So the question is, is obviously what happened with the drugs. Now, what I did is, is I actually had to look at what is the biology. And I've been making a case for many years that the uh, all drugs that target MS actually deplete the memory B cell, and that will probably block the relapsing uh, disease, possibly uh, via an effect on T cells, if you want. Now, if we start to look at the lesions of uh, COVID, there aren't too many natural killer cells. There aren't too many general granular sites. And the neutrophils, when present, uh, tend to be where there's actually secondary infections. And in, in, certainly in the animal systems, you don't really see that very much. So that kind of leaves us the, um, the trio, uh, the trilogy of, 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 of vaccination which is essentially the uh, monocyte, a macrophage, the CD8 cell, and the antibody producing cell. Now, I, what I would argue is if we look at the biology, it suggests that in some cases that uh, the virus can be removed before the antibody response, suggesting that the CD8 and the macrophages may be important. And it's interesting when you think about uh, what is the central lesion in MS, it's, it's CD8 and the macrophage lesion, 
and many of our drugs don't really target this progressive lesion. So maybe that gives us some indication what may happen. Now, what I want to do is focus uh, on the macrophage as the central player in, in actually getting rid of the virus in the first place. And if that's true, then I think that it becomes more interesting about how it relates to uh, MS. Now, we can get some indication of what's going on by looking at what happened with um, SARS. And that was um, obviously uh, another infection that originated in bats. And if we look in the literature, it says in the early lesions, you have neutrophils, macrophages, CD8 cells, and that the CD8 cells are important for viral clearance. And then if you get a secondary infection, that the CD8 cells are particularly important, you do need the antibody response, that helps. And also a T cell response will help because CD4 or T cell help. And that's because they help uh, antibody producing cells and they help CD8 producing cells. And I think the emerging data uh, from uh, um, COVID-19 is actually something very similar. I would argue perhaps the early lesions don't have so many neutrophils, um, but otherwise I think probably the, the same story will hold. Now, when we look at animals, that gives us some indication. So here's a, a monkey infected with um, the virus and you can see the viral response and you can see it's gone by about day uh, nine or 10. So it tells you there's an immunity within three to five days. And if you re-challenge with a new virus, there is no viral response. So it tells you, you can vaccinate. And so you can get protective immunity. Now, the interesting thing again, is when you look at these individuals, that um, the antibody response didn't arrive between uh, two to three weeks. And of course, the virus was originally eliminated largely before that. So what I was suggesting here is that the innate and the T cell response may be centrally important, and then you get the added benefit of the, the antibody response, which particularly would stop reinfection. Um, and so the question is, can you kind of avoid uh, B cells? And the answer is, well, there are some cases of people with X-linked A gamma globulinemia, so they don't have B cells and they can recover. Uh, and then we have the pharmacological evidence. So people are treated with B cell depleting agents, alemtuzumab, cladribine, rituximab, ocrelizumab. And on the whole, people are actually recovering. So there's you know, probably more uh, evidence for uh, what's happened with rituximab than any other drug. And uh, you know, not to say it gets a clean bit of health, but um, you know, it certainly looks the case that most people do recover. Now, are antibodies important? Well, yes, we know they are because you can take those antibodies and you can put them into humans. It clears the virus within about three days and in some individuals, they will recover. So neutralizing antibody responses are beneficial and that's good. Now, we also have to recognize that actually it's not all good. And um, the antibody can be uh, maybe something that can target the macrophages and perhaps it can also... Uh, create cells to be destroyed via a complement mediated attack. And it can also take the virus into the, the, um, the macrophage via a process called antibody dependent um, enhancement. So it kind of takes the virus to the macrophage. So it, it'd be important to then think about that when we think about which parts of the virus molecule we want to target for a vaccine. Here's the uh, a lung of a severely infected person that, um, full of macrophages, few T cells, very few B cells. So that's kind of, is the central pathology. So where I was when I kind of rewrote the review was, um, you know, the SARS uh, affects the, uh, the lung, uh, and then you get an innate immune system really going in to deal with the virus, then the CD8 and, and an antibody response is formed, which then probably works alongside the complement system to uh, eradicate the virus. And that happens in, about you know, 50 to 80% of the people quite, quite easily. Now what happens, it appears that the virus can escape some of this immune destruction, and then that leads to a hyperinflammation uh, of the macrophage system. Then that can cause the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, causing the hypoxemia. And um, that's kind of where I was. Now, probably in the last couple of weeks, it's, it's really become clear that one of the central problems of COVID is also uh, a vascular pathology, and that relates to the endothelium and also the uh, renin-angiotensin uh, system, 
And that then links into creating the hyperinflammation and also feeds into the lung damage. And that links in with the coagulation system and it can uh, end up creating a, a clot. And the clot obviously uh, is, is, a, is a central pathology that we've seen, particularly also in the kids with the Kawasaki -like, uh, disease. And it seems that one of the issues may be that the way that um, the, the virus blocks the ACE, uh, ACE2, and, that, and so that blocks uh, the formation of uh, angiotensin 1-7 from angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 1-7 is an antioxidant, and so you will probably get a loading of superoxide uh, and creates vascular damage that releases von Willebrand factor, which then forms a clot. And that may be part of the central pathology of, of COVID-19. So the question you ask is then what do the MS drugs do to that? And the answer is probably very little. Uh, what do they do to the neutrophils? Most drugs don't have a major effect. What do the drugs do to the tissue macrophages? Most drugs have no effect. Uh, monocytes, well, uh, it's a transient deletion with omentuzumab, and maybe natalizumab could block that into the inflamed lung. But remember, if the macrophages are also a central part of the pathology, natalizumab would block that. And maybe with the extended dosing interval, that uh, it will allow the monocytes into the lung, just like it potentially allows uh, monocytes into the brain. So what about the CD8 cells, which are important for the vaccine? Well. Um, alamtizumab can be depleted by um, um, can deplete the CD8 cells uh, probably the uh, the most uh, and the longest duration. Natalizumab could potentially could block their uh, migration into cells. Fingolimod can also cause lymphopenia and dimethylphenarate in about 20% of people can cause relatively uh, marked uh, CD8 lymph lymphopenia. Cladribine on the other hand actually generally stays within uh, normal limits. So that gives you an indication of how those cells may affect um, a vaccine response. What about an antibody response? Well, if we look at the targets of the major depleting agents, alentuzumab, uh, cladribine, uh, ocaluzumab, for example, they're probably, the targets are not probably ex well expressed on the, um, the plasma cells. So, you know, once they're formed, that should be okay. But obviously we know with uh, continuous B cell depletion, it can cause um, uh, uh, hypergamma globulinemia. So that obviously will be interesting if you're thinking about a vaccine. And also these cells can block the immature cells. And these are gonna be the precursors for the cells that actually are gonna create the vaccine response. So they're the ones that we need to think about. So that's all I want to talk about uh, the MS drugs. And that's how you can then view how they will be important. Now, just to give you an indication I th why I think the macrophages are particularly important, was this case study by Wallace, and he allowed me to present it. And it was a case history of an individual who had got MS, a relapsing MS, and they were treated in uh, early February with uh, Lemtrada, their second dose. Their lymphocyte count was 0.1. Their partner um, would been to Italy and actually got a uh, PCR-tested COVID-19 positive. And this individual uh, then was shown to have COVID-19. The, the, the patient then developed a symptoms which would be consistent with um, COVID-19 um, and they lasted one week and they resolved. Now, obviously the interesting thing is their lymphocyte count here was 0.2. Um, now we don't know that they had the virus because we haven't had a test, but the incubation period was consistent with that, suggesting again, importance perhaps of the innate immune system uh, in getting rid of the virus. So that uh, is, is good news potentially. And I would point out that many people with uh, alentuzumab can make antibody responses to the drug. So potentially that's within one month when you've got no T or B cells. And the importance here is that only about 2% of cells are in the blood. And therefore, you know, with many of these drugs, they're not really clearing the lymphoid tissues out and therefore you can make responses. Now, can you get a reinfection with COVID-19? Well, the answer is uh, we don't know. Uh, you can certainly get a protective immunity. We've seen that with um, the monkeys. And can you get a, a protective immunity? Well, we don't know. We don't know how long it lasts. Now, there are coronaviruses that are a cold-like virus and, and they, their immunity doesn't appear to last forever. So you may need to booster. And we look to SARS, then 
it was evident that the uh, antibody responses would quite often drop within a year or two. And that may be because there was no antigen in the system to actually keep boosting the response. And then there's a question about these people who keep cropping up with uh, the virus. And here's an individual who was negative, then they went positive, then they went negative again. And I think that's partly due to the, um, the way that the test is going out. So I'm not really convinced that uh, yet is people are getting reinfected. That's what I want to say. Now, in terms of um, stopping infection, we obviously want to boost vaccination, particularly for the people who haven't. And there are a whole host of different um, vaccines. So you can have a chemically inactivated vaccine like a polio virus, attenuated uh, live virus, such as uh, uh, an NMR vaccine. We've got some new kind of tools. So you can have a, a nucleic acid uh, vaccine. So the idea is you kind of make the protein. So you would inject DNA, which will make a protein, or you can inject RNA, which will make, uh, sorry, DNA will make RNA, which will make protein, or you can inject the RNA, which will make protein. And that's one way of making a protein. And that could be done quite uh, quickly. Uh, or you can actually make protein and in, uh, in, in inject with an adjuvant as you do with tetanus toxide. Or there's the oxid uh, approach where you take a, a virus and then you actually make it express um, SARS-CoV-2, the whole stack of them. And here's just a, a list that I got from um, Nature, um, uh, one of the Nature Reviews. And that shows you that there's over a hundred different uh, studies ongoing. Some of them have got into humans, um, but some of them are obviously in the experimental stage. Now, I'll leave Gary, Gavin to talk about the um, advantages of the different viruses. Obviously, with uh, live viruses, then obviously they're contraindicated for certain MS drugs. Now, what we want from a virus is we want it to do generate a neutralizing antibody response. We want it to induce uh, CD8 T cell protection. We want to try and get it so it can block the virus from infecting the cell. And we want it to make long-lived immunological memory. And we would like to uh, get a vaccine against a target that um, the virus can't mutate it to get it away. So obviously one of the things is if you target the, um, um, the receptor binding domain, if it mutates it too much, it'll stop binding to its target. So that's obviously one candidate. Now the question is, is how long is that going to take? And you know, with a safety um, process, it will take months and months and months for these to develop. So they're not probably going to arrive really, really quickly. And so that obviously you have to think about that when you're thinking about are we virus red, uh, vaccine ready? We haven't got a, a vaccine yet. Now, the question is, is when we do get a vaccine, how are we going to test it? So um, that's where we've done actually terribly, uh, I think, in terms of uh, testing uh, people who have been infected. So there are different ways of, of doing it. And obviously we test the RNA to show if there's a viral infection. And then we test the antibodies to show uh, that there has been an infection. And so there are a number of different tests and I just wanna quickly run through those. So obviously there's the nasal swab or, or, or now there's evidence suggesting that saliva could be a good place to look. And uh, that actually tests for viral uh, particles. And then we have a different, um, um, methods to test for antibodies. So we have these lateral flow systems. Um, you know, the government spent a lot of money buying some rubbish from um, a company. And uh, well, obviously there, there are some other plans for new agents. So the idea is you drop a blood on, on, on a kind of a filter. It then starts to get pulled in through um, just as it kind of wicks through. And what happens in the filter is there is a colloidal goal with a uh, the COVID antigen, it gets pulled along the front of the wicking. And at the top, there's a anti uh, COVID um, antibody and that creates a line. Likewise, um, there's some way you actually have a layer, line of IgM and that gives you an IgM response that shows you, if you've just got an IgM response that like you're in early infection because IgM is uh, there first and then later on you'll get an IgG response and that shows you've kind of still got an active uh, ongoing infection. And then what will happen is the IgM will disappear and then you'll get just the IgG response and that tells you you've been infected. And that's kind of the test that we probably will want to be able to get tested at people at home. 
Um, now there is obviously a lab-based test and there are a couple, you know, there's the ELISAs, which is typically using a, an antibody, but the ones that the commercial companies are using are chemiluminescence uh, assays. And essentially what they do is they, you have the sample with the antibody, then there's a, a, a detection system um, with, in this case, nucleotide capsid antigen, and then there's a biotinylated uh, nucleic capsid antigen. That then forms a complex with the anti antibody if it's there. You then add avidin to the, uh, which links to the biotin, that's got magnetic particles on, then you give an electrical thing, it traps the antibody, and that uh, electrical stimulus gives a, 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 a signal to the ruthenylated uh, nucleic capsid to give off light, and that's how you measure it, and that's one of the tests. And this is just some data looking at the level of the um, antibody response to the different parts. So the spike comes in two, two parts. There's this uh, uh, subunit one and subunit two. The re uh, receptor binding domain is in subunit one. And what you can see here is actually by day 14, most people who've been tested positive with the, uh, um, the PCR test show an antibody response. And that's probably why the companies have largely focused on the nuclear capsid. Now we have the uh, retinal binding, uh, receptor binding domain. You can see the odd person here isn't making an, an antibody response. And so they're probably not making a neutralizing antibody response. And that was actually shown actually yesterday. So here's a paper uh, I popped out from um, where they're screening hospital doctors. And this is looking at the neutralizing response. And actually, one bit of concern is in some individuals, actually, it doesn't last very long, um, only a few months. And what they, they found was in the symptomatic people, about 10% of those aren't making neutralizing responses. And in the asymptomatic individuals, about 56% don't make a neutralizing antibody response. So what about the tests that uh, are currently ongoing? There's the Roche test and the Abbott test, and they are both pretty good. Uh, looking at the data. So in terms of sensitivity, which is essentially looking for um, true positives, they claim they're 100%. And then in terms of specificity, is working out what is a true negative. And um, we'll see how, how that goes. So this data was from the Roche um, um, product sheet. I didn't find the Abbott one yet. So um, we'll see. The academics will get their hands into it and actually then find out really how, how sensitive they are. Because I think if you've had disease, it's much easier to find um, antibody. The, the real central issue is going to be in the asymptomatics. And here's uh, looking at different in individuals over time. You can see in the symptomatics, uh, by 15 days, virtually everybody's detectably positive. Whereas in the asymptomatics, you have the negatives. And that's where we'll see with the different tests uh, how good they are, because that, the good ones will pick up the uh, asymptomatic people. So that's important, obviously, because um, you know, antibody responses are going to be, tell you whether you've been infected. And the importance of the different uh, DMTs is um, what it does to the antibody response. And uh, we mentioned the immature B cells. And uh, what happens with certainly ocrelizumab is you keep those B cells at a nadir for a long time. And even if you stop the uh, ocrelizumab, it takes uh, between 15 to 18 months for those um, uh, cells to recover. So even if you think you're vaccine ready and you stop, it's going to take a long time for those cells to recover. Now with uh, alentuzumab, that's uh, maybe three to six months that uh, the, the mem uh, immature B cells recover very quickly. Cladribine a slightly slower, um, but it just tell you um, again that with these um, immune reconstitution therapies is, you know, once the drugs have gone, then the B cells can potentially recover if, if there's an infection. So that's obviously going to be important in how you phase different drugs. And that's important because, you know, it can block vaccine responses. This is some data from uh, Apoluzumab. Gavin's going to talk to you a bit about it in a, in a minute. And this will help you trying to dissociate and, and, and suggest which are your important um, targets. And all I would say is what you need to do is obviously pick the best knowledge at the time and that will change as, as, as time will go. I am not a neurologist, but my prediction in the long term, I think it will be something like this. <laughs> but we'll, we'll see. So in summary, I can say that the uh, SARS pathology is, is due to a hyper uh, inflammation of the innate immune system. 
uh, there's a vascular uh, hypercoagulopathy, and probably the MS drugs don't touch that too much. Then we have the viral el elimination via the immune system, the innate immune system, T cells, CD8 cells, and antibody. And it suggests if that's true, then many of the MS drugs won't really touch that so much. And that's possibly why what we're seeing or probably seeing is that actually people on, with MS are doing probably not much worse than people in the general population. And it doesn't seem to matter if you're on a DMT. Um, so that is then rather consistent with the biology. We can say that immunity occurs and it's you know, potentially T cell driven and uh, a neutralizing antibody response would be important. So that would be important for the adaptive immune response. Uh, we can say that some of these uh, agents will blunt the, um, uh, the vaccine response. Uh, there's an early risk from immune reconstitution therapies because they're the most deleting. And obviously, if you continuously deplete uh, your um, B cells and your T cells and they're at low levels, then obviously there will be some risk. I guess the, the, the question is the truth will be known. And soon, once these tests come along, we'll be able to test people to see how they are making an antibody response. So there is already one uh, individual with oculizumab treatment. Um, I think it was oculizumab, could have been um, tuximab, that has made an antibody response. So certainly, even if you are B cell depleted, you can still make a response. Um, at the moment, a vaccine has not been approved. We don't know in what form that will be, whether it's going to be a live vaccine or, uh, or, or a non-live non vaccine. Uh, how, how safe it will be, we will have to wait and see. And also importantly, we will have to wait and see how long is the duration of immunity? Because the question is, 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 is it actually a one-off vaccine or would it be something um, that we have to be um, retreating over and over again? And a bit like the flu to some extent. So that then may uh, then impinge on, on how ready we are in terms of vaccine readiness. So I'll thank you for listening, and I will now turn it all over to uh, Gavin. Okay, so while, while, this is, uh, while I'm going to share my screen, I think it's important just to please, if you want to ask questions, use the Q&A sheet. And there's really a question there, which is probably not relevant to this talk. Are there deaths of MS patients affected by COVID-19? If yes, do you have any information? Yes, I think if you, there's a publication that came out from Italy in the Lancet Neurology, um, there have been verbal reports of deaths in this country. I think what the message is, is that uh, people with MS dying from COVID-19 seem to have the same risk factors as the general population, old age, comorbidities, uh, more advanced disease. Uh, so it seems to be the same picture rather than the DMT that dictates uh, death, you know. Okay, so um, vaccination during the COVID, I think it's important that we discuss vaccinations in general. Um, I've got a large number of disclosures in relation to all the DMTs. I'm gonna be s talking about several of them in this presentation. So we all know how to de-risk DMTs and really in, in the, in the uh, baseline investigations that we do, we do actually review um, vaccinations. Most people focus on making sure people have varicella zoster virus antibodies. Uh, simply because um, uh, it's a risk factor for infection if you uh, if you on immunosuppression getting uh, the chickenpox uh, as an adult. And one of the things that we're beginning to uh, screen for now is people that haven't got a childhood history of mumps, measles, and rubella vaccine. Uh, simply because with anti-vaccine movement, you don't really want to be on some of our therapies and develop either measles, mumps, or rubella, which are neurotropic viruses. Uh, in, in view of the complications. And there have been some pickups, yeah, I'm aware of, uh, they started this first in Melbourne, Australia, picking up quite a few cases that hadn't been vaccinated with MMR, having to have vaccines before starting on, for example, nalaluzumab. Other vaccines that are being looked at as HPV, um, simply because um, the government policy has only been to vaccinate young women, young girls. They've now moved to boys, which is starting. And they do that at age 12, 13. Uh, and so some people, multiple sclerosis, may have missed out on that. And they may want to update their HPV vaccine status before going on to therapy. And there's a protocol for doing that. Uh, and other vaccines will become important, just like the, uh, if a vaccine does emerge for the uh, coronavirus. So let's give a case. And this is one of the, my cases why vaccine, uh, vaccines are important in managing MS. So this is a 42-year-old journalist. 
he's a war correspondent and he travels to war zones. So he's often out of the country and he's out of the country often for prolonged periods of time. So he was diagnosed with relapsing disease in 2016. He was put on dimethyl fumarate uh, and went on to have two attacks on DMF and uh, then came to see me for a second opinion. Uh, and I classed him as having rapidly evolving severe MS because he'd had two attacks in a 12 month period with MRI activity. And he wanted to have the HACT, um, but unfortunately the London criteria wouldn't allow him to be referred for HACT because dimethyl fumarate is not classed as a high efficacy therapy. You have to fail at least one high efficacy therapy. So at that time, this is before acrolizumab was available, he was, avail he was eligible for fingolimod, natalizumab, cladribine, and nalimtuzumab. And the question is which DMT? Um, um, uh, <clears throat> and the, the real issue is that his television station he works for, his employer, uh, required him to have up-to-date vaccine, travel vaccines. So vaccines were really, really important for him uh, to be able to have the vaccine. So we found him to be JC positive, which basically at that time took out JC virus, um, uh, took out nalizumab. We didn't like, he didn't like fingolimod because he wasn't keen on immunosuppression and the fact that he couldn't have vaccines. So he actually uh, wanted alimtuzumab um, um, because he wanted the most effective therapy. But my concern was that uh, having monitoring in a war zone developing a secondary autoimmunity in a war zone uh, would be difficult. So I actually spoke him down and he went on to cladribine. So the good thing about cladribine is that David's already mentioned, once you have immune reconstitution, which tends to occur six to nine months usually, sometimes a little bit longer um, after the last dose, uh, vaccines are, are fine, but both uh, component and live attenuated vaccines. So, uh, you know, this is an example where an immune reconstitution therapy uh, was the agent of choice for vaccines. Uh, if he'd had HACT, he could also have vaccines. Um, just to say to you that in people that are not on immunotherapy, I think the consensus view, and this is a publication that came out in 2019, and we're about to get ours hopefully uh, accepted, it's in final stages of review, uh, um, our center's policy, and we've, and we've written a vaccine paper. Uh, Sowell Rays has been the senior author on that in collaboration with the vaccine department at Public Health England. So we ha are gonna produce some guidelines uh, about vaccinations, but the benefits of vaccines generally outweigh their risks. Immune response to antigenic stimulation is similar to that of individuals without MS and the vaccine schedule should be verified and updated after diagnosis of MS is established. So I think you need to actually include as part of your uh, consultation now vaccine status and whether or not you should have vaccines. So I'm not going to go through this. This will be in the publication. So these are the vaccines that are on the table for uh, adults with multiple sclerosis. Um, they include flu, pneumococcus, uh, <clears throat> there is a lazoster. There is the live attenuated vaccine. The recombinant vaccine will hopefully be within us for two or three years. Believe it or not, GSK make Shingrex can't make enough of it for the world. And so the UK has been left off the list, despite GSK being a British company, they can't make enough vaccine to supply Britain. But they are up in their production technology. And uh, I sit on the Public Health England vex, uh, VZB vaccine panel. And we're hoping that this vaccine will be available at least in, in, for immunocompromised patients first. And within three to five years, it'll be available at a population level. Um, HPV vaccine is there, um, and there's two types. Uh, at the moment, NHS England only covers the Gardasil 4, which is four serotypes. Um, unfortunately, uh, um, in the future, they may move to the 9, Gardasil 9, which is the polyvalent one, and it's much better because it covers so many more uh, strains that cause uh, cervical cancer, and also co covers HPV strains that cause warts which are a problem in uh, some of our immunosuppressive therapies, particularly the maintenance immunosuppressive therapies. So please do not uh, ignore HPV. There's uh, another reason for doing it is that uh, um, sexually transmitted diseases are increasing older pe in older people simply because of uh, dating apps and, and social media now. And uh, I don't know why, but older people are not uh, uh, being careful when it comes to uh, uh, sex. They have a lot of unprotected intercourse. And so HPV is emerging as a real issue in older people. And so there's, there's a reason if somebody's missed out on having uh, vaccines as an adolescent, um, I think we should be offering them HPV vaccine uh, even if they're uh, missed out. 
And then in pregnant women, there are the, uh, the standard uh, protocols for that. What about the immunomodulatory agents? So betaferon's fine, GA is fine, question mark around live vaccines, teriflunamide, uh, live attenuated vaccines are not recommended. I personally think that shouldn't be allowed um, based on the uh, immunological profile of teriflunamide, it's not really immunosuppressive and they should deal with uh, live attenuated vaccines without a problem. I think this is just carryover from the leflunamide uh, rheumatology label. D DMF, no live vaccines, fingolimod, no vaccines, natalizumab, question mark around all vaccines, but no live vaccines. Um, there have been studies showing that uh, natalizumab treated patients do make responses to neoantigens and to influenza, but there are other publications showing blunted responses. So I'm not 100% sure natalizumab clears, clears the board in terms of uh, being able to mount an immune response. Ocrelizumab, no, blunted responses, uh, which is relevant to the uh, later case studies today. Alimtuzumab, no live vaccines, but once you've, recon once you've reconstituted, uh, live vaccines should be fine. There has been publications showing people having alimtuzumab, having live vaccines without any problems. Similarly with cladribine, once you've reconstituted, and mitoxandrine, once you've reconstituted, live vaccines should be fine. So in summary, um, reviewing and updating immunization should be an integral part of routine care. DMTs may influence immune responses, so you need to know about this uh, and have DMT-specific knowledge, and you have to be proactive about this. Uh, this is something we can't just let happen, uh, possibly or not. Um, there's going to be a case uh, that has legal implications. You know, if somebody is not offered an uh, upgrade of a vaccine and they develop a problem, they may come back and uh, come back with a legal case against you. So I think as a practicing healthcare professional, you need to be proactive about counseling patients around vaccines. So let's move on to a case. Um, you'll all recognize the scenario. This is a 24 year old male teacher, uh, successfully treated with alimtuzumab in January and January 2017 and 18, taking six months off work to travel in, in South America as an English teacher. From an MS perspective as well, his last full blood count show reconstitution 1.4. He's been advised to update his travel vaccines and he wants to go and visit the Galapagos Islands, which as you know, it belongs to Ecuador and Ecuador require yellow fever vaccination. He's concerned about having vaccines that may trigger relapses because uh, he's read about this. Uh, what are you going to advise about vaccines and relapses in general and about the yellow fever vaccine? Well, the thing about the yellow fever vaccine, um, <clears throat> I'll come back, is that there is one publication showing that may trigger relapses and we may have to correct our position on that. So the question is, do vaccines affect the onset of relapses? And I think we can be quite confident uh, in saying that the majority of vaccines do not increase the risk of developing MS that have been studied, okay? Uh, and we can say that hepatitis, tetanus, tick-borne encephalitis and influenza that have been studied do not increase the risk of relapses. And this is important because uh, as you know, um, about a third of relapses um, occur in response to infection. Um, and so you could argue that a live vaccine is like having a mild infection, does it trigger relapses? So I think we can be evidence-based around these vaccines, uh, don't trigger relapses, um, but we can't be 100% sure about yellow fever. And the reason why I say this is, is this publication out of Argentina just reporting uh, seven patients okay, who had had uh, vaccines and then had um, uh, relapses uh, uh, triggered. I must point out that these patients were on first generation injectable therapies and that may be the reason why they had relapses. Um, just come out, and this is literally hot off the press, um, has been a publication that came out in the second tier neurology journal. Uh, and basically uh, a, a significant number of these patients were on second generation orals or monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and uh, although nine patients experienced uh, relapses in the pre-exposure period, like only one person exp experienced a relapse after vaccination, all right? And so the conclusion is it doesn't look like based on this current uh, um, um, uh, study that yellow fever vaccination triggered relapses. Uh, what's important is none of the patients on a high efficacy therapy like natalizumab had a, a relapse. So I actually think we need to reinterpret the yellow fever vaccine and say it's safe uh, in the current contemporary environment based on this new data. Uh, and I can be 
give you personal experience. I've had three patients post alemtuzumab and I've had now two patients post cladribine who've all been uh, received yellow fever vaccines for travel to South America and they've all handled the vaccine without any problems or complications. Case three, 38 year old woman on rocrolizumab for 18 months. Her next infusion has been delayed. She's keen to be vaccinated when the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 vaccine becomes available. This is assuming we're gonna have one. Now, I give it about a 60% chance of success. So let's say we do get a successful vaccine. She's querying whether or not she should switch from rocrolizumab because of its history of poor response. Uh, what would you recommend? Okay, and what theoretical considerations uh, need to be taken into account? I think David's already mentioned this to you, is that uh, when you uh, have an anti-CD19 like ocrelizumab, this is the phase two data, you can see it takes at least six, uh, probably 12 to 15 months to get some B cells coming back uh, to a level where you, you think you mount, uh, mount an immune response, okay? Um, this is looking at the lymph nodes of somebody's on rituximab. You can see it obliterates germinal centers. So you, you need germinal centers for good quality affinity maturation with T-cell help. And so people that have had uh, anti-CD20 don't have germinal centers. And this explains why they can't make good quality antibody responses is because they don't have the ability to affinity mature and have T-cell help to make antibody responses. So this is essentially like a functional splenectomy in a way. So you've got to manage patients on anti-CD20 if they've had a functional splenectomy. And we have data, David's already mentioned this to you, showing that antibody responses are blunted on uh, ocrelizumab, uh, and particularly the pneumococcal vaccine, which is why we make sure all our patients get vaccinated on a pneumo with pneumovax prior to going on to. Uh, so it's, uh, it's likely that if somebody is on ocrelizumab or rituximab uh, and a SARS coronavirus 2 vaccine comes about, they're not gonna mount a good uh, immune response. Uh, and so the strategy is gonna have to be probably to delay their um, next infusion or miss an infusion until you get some B cell reconstitution before you vaccinate them. Another issue is the spike protein, and David's already mentioned to you, is heavily glycosylated. And we know from other vaccine studies that glycoproteins and uh, carbohydrate antigens actually require uh, splenic function and they require germinal center function. So, um, and these are the these are the um, the reason why the spike protein is heavily glycosylated because it's part of immune uh, uh, immune evasion that the virus uses. So to get good neutralizing antibodies, you're going to have to make good anti glycoprotein antibody responses, and this is going to require germinal centers. Uh, and so I I suspect we're going to need to uh, have a strategy of uh, delaying uh, on the next course before dosing. Okay, time for the final case study. I think I only had four. The 36-year-old woman with uh, on fingolimod. She's concerned about uh, uh, not being able to have the, the, the coronavirus vaccine. What are you going to advise? And I think same, similarly, with, uh, although the, uh, the current dogma states that lymphocytes are still in the system, and they're just trapped in secondary uh, lymphoid organs. And when you re remove fingolimod, you're able to remobilize them. I think the reality is not quite like that, a large number of patients uh, do have blunted immune responses, and this is just the uh, Novartis vaccine study looking at influenza and tetanus. Although they do mount, mount an immune response, it's blunted. Whether or not this immune response is going to be of good enough quality to uh, form neutralizing antibodies against the coronavirus is unknown. <clears throat> um, I'll leave this slide out. Okay, um, I think with cladribine, we can be confident that. Uh, this is David's uh, paper, just showing you that once you immune reconstitute, you have all the components in place to make, make a good antibody response. So I don't think uh, cladribine treated patients are gonna be an issue in terms of vaccine readiness. Um, and this is actually the uh, no, uh, Biogen uh, uh, natalizumab study, just showing you that natalizumab patients compared to controls make antibody responses as well. Uh, and so I think uh, provided the vaccine's not a live vaccine, uh, I think it'd be quite risky to give people with natalizumab a live neurotropic, potentially neurotropic uh, vaccine uh, in case they get an encephalitic illness posted. But if it's a, if it's a component vaccine, I think uh, natalizumab patients are likely to have the necessary immune function in the background to make antibody responses. But we don't know that until we've done the studies. So there's lots of uh, unknowns but I think we've got some um, 
information to go on in the meantime. So I'll stop there and take questions. Oh, there's a, David, it's for you, Dave. What do you think of BCG, the BCG vaccine hypothesis protecting us from COVID? Um, well, I, I guess at, at the moment on the whole, actually it's been kind of disproven to some extent. So I know there was an idea um, of people getting BCG vaccination would, would get a reduced uh, COVID-19. Um, I would probably suggest, look at the data. I mean, if you think about the UK, I can certainly remember my BCG uh, vaccination and, and all the people that are actually doing really badly are, are people of my, my, my age. So they've all been VCG vaccination. I think there's been a number of papers actually also published um, questioning how, how solid that idea really is. Um, so I don't think um, at the moment from what I've read that it, it has a lot of water in it. It holds much water anyway. Um, I'm always there to be proved wrong, of course. So. Okay, here's another question. Um, what are the four main structural proteins uh, of the coronavirus, Dave? Well, I should be asking you that, shouldn't I? Um, well, so the, um, the spike, so we know the spike, and that's, uh, as I say, it's a, a trimer. And um, there's the, the, the that's, so that's number one, the envelope protein, the membrane protein and the, the nucleic capsid. So they're the, the four main uh, structural proteins of the uh, 29. Okay. Um, I guess the question is, which ones are the uh, most immunogenic? I, uh, most people are putting their interest in nu nucleic capsid and, and spike. Uh, in terms of the, um, the PCR, um, it depends. So some, some uh, studies are looking at um, uh, the nucleic capsid. Um, there are some uh, papers where they've actually looked at some of these uh, ancillary um, molecule or proteins within the cell, and they've actually got 100% uh, specific and sensitive uh, tests from looking for other parts of the, the, the viral genome. Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, just to let the people know, the vaccine that's furthest ahead is in China, where they've been using a, uh, an inactivated virus. So they grow up the coronavirus in a culture system then purify it and then they inactivate it and that's this is that's kind of the oldest technology available for making vaccines but so what if it works it works uh, and i think that is considered an inactivated vaccine and that one that will be the one that um, probably emerges first in terms of phase two to three data the the, the other ones that have been pushed rapidly are the um, nucleotide ones, both the RNA ones and the DNA ones. Now, the good thing about those, if those are effective, um, they're easy to scale up. So you could potentially make billions of doses very rapidly because of the technology to make them is, 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 um, there, uh, is established in small labs. The ones that won't come quickly are the component ones, which is what Big Pharma are doing. You know, they're trying to make these uh, component vaccines with uh, particular particular um, antigens. And for, to do that, you need enormous uh, facilities in terms of reactors and, and they, those will take uh, two, 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 or plus year, two plus years to get there. So this will be an interesting uh, competition, David, I think, between uh, the academic uh, um, small startups versus the big farmer who gets there first with the most effective, with an effective vaccine, you know. Well, who, who are you going to put your money on, David? Oh, I don't know. I don't put my money on anywhere. I don't bet. <laughs> I'll put it on pharma, though. That's one thing I, I will say. Um, you know, I think if you look at the um, the number of uh, academics of making uh, vaccine ideas and uh, academics making antibody tests, you know, which ones have been approved? It's the pharma pharma based one. So well, that, you say that though, but David, <laughs> the the most successful vaccines on the planet have been smallpox, and that was made by a, an academic in a bird of commerce, and and the polio, <laughs> and the polio vaccines were made by uh, academics. So yeah. you know, maybe maybe we've got a chance here. So Riffet's, <laughs> Riffet's got a question. Yeah, um, I welcome the latest changes to avian guidelines and uh, DMT and MS. Hopefully by next review date, we will have more data to advise on vaccine readiness. Do you think we should start checking uh, CD19, CD20 counts from now 
on as a routine for patients on ocrelizumab. Uh, so we see who might make some antibody. Yes, I think what's going to have to happen, Rifat, is that one of the questions we can answer is taking people with MS who are on ocrelizumab, who get infected with the virus, and look at the antibody responses. And that's a study we're going to be doing in our center is collecting these patients and seeing if the, if the uh, quantitative response in, in terms of the titer uh, is, is, is uh, uh, as high as people who, who are not on an anti-CD20. And then also looking at the qualitative responses. Do they make IgA, IgG, and uh, are they neutralizing antibodies? And so David and I are busy involved in, a, in an ethics application now to get this pro project off the ground. I think that will give us some kind of information uh, whether or not uh, people on anti-CD20 therapies will make um, um, an adequate response. But again, um, I hate to say this to you, but coronaviruses have a history of generating very poor and very short lasting immunity. And that may apply to the vaccine as well. So you may be vaccinating people and the antibody responses disappear within a few months to years, which makes them susceptible to a repeat infection. And that's why we don't get rid of common colds because we get reinfected with the same virus. It may, it may have a bit of drift, but it's essentially the same virus, the two species of coronavirus out there that cause common colds. I can see uh, uh, this particular you know, SARS coronavirus 2 persisting as a, an endemic viral infection for, for, forever. And we will just you know, get new variants. Uh, what do you think about, do you, do you disagree with me, David? You may disagree with me there. No, no, no. Um, no, and we've got another question about plasma therapy, which um, obviously there's a number of studies going on um, in terms of uh, taking convalescent uh, sera and um, uh, um, you know, showing benefit. And so I guess the question there is, is we probably also need to have a, a test to make sure that we can find the people with a very high uh, new, uh, titers. And then also the other question that's important to know is, is, you know, what, what bits do you want? Because antibodies can be good and antibodies can be bad. And, um, you know, so I, I think ideally you'd want to try and purify it against uh, known antigens rather than just um, making like a, a an intravenous immunoglobulin of, of convalescent patients. But well, I mean, there are, there are, so, there are certain um, academic labs cloning out those high affinity neutralizing antibodies from previously infected patients. So we're probably mm -hmm. going to find a, an emergence of a whole lot of monoclonals. Oh uh, God, there, there, there's loads of them. Uh, <laughs> every, 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 lab's, every lab who does that stuff has already made them. Mm. Um, I can just, tell you 20 papers already. So. Just to say to the, um, the audience is the technology now for cloning human antibodies from peripheral blood B cells is mature and, and uh, is now, uh, you know, many academic labs and many pharma companies have it down to a path. They can actually literally get the stuff done in two to three weeks in terms of the technology. And then what you do is you create a hybridoma and you make tons of this stuff. So those will probably um, uh, be going into clinical trial, the monoclonals, um, to try and uh, reduce the severity of COVID-19. Mm. Um, if a patient has no antibodies for hep B or C, do you vaccinate the patient? Well, we don't have a hepatitis C vaccine to my knowledge. Uh, and hep B is um, only really indicated, I didn't put that on that slide, but hep B is only indicated for high risk professions. So if you're working in the medical profession or in a profession where you're going to get exposed to hepatitis B, at the moment you, you get mm -hmm. vaccinated. Um, that depends what country you live in. In some countries of the world, hepatitis B is part of the national uh, vaccination mm. program. I think China is one of those countries, for example. Mm. They're trying to um, get rid of the, the, the virus. But uh, in the UK, hep B is only indicated for high risk yeah. patients. And I guess, it, remember, it takes a long time as well. So uh, you know, when you start to be vaccinated, uh, as, as, as a recipient of that, I know I didn't, re I didn't respond for the first round, so I had to have a Another, another round of uh, vaccine. So it can take a long time. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that, that's an issue with um, DMTs. You've got somebody with very active disease and they want to have the HPV vaccine, for mm. example. The, um, it's a, uh, at the moment, the polyvalent one, uh, which they have to buy privately, is three doses. One month, two and month six. And then you've got to wait four weeks after the final dose before you start immuno, immunotherapy. So that could delay starting a treatment for seven months. Now, that's the advantage um, in this situation. If somebody does want to have the HPV vaccine, you could potentially start off with the first two, and you can actually delay the third one 
um, according to the guy with for six more months, as long as it's given within the first year. And so you could potentially give, for example, uh, cladribine or alemtuzumab, and then uh, give them their third dose before the next course uh, when they've reconstituted. That's one strategy uh, in terms of not having to de delay therapy. So the immune reconstitution therapies, you know, do offer you some flexibility around uh, vaccination strategies. Uh, whereas the uh, continuous immunosuppressive therapies, you're not. But I don't personally think, I don't know if you agree with me, I don't think we should be stopping people's uh, um, or delaying oculizumab treatment in anticipation that there's going to be a vaccine in six months or nine. We have no idea when it's going to emerge. So my personal opinion is to dose, to dose, to dose as according to guidelines. And only when the vaccine becomes available do we then delay the therapy. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I would also say, Again, you know, we, we've got in our heads that, you know, antibodies are the key. But, you know, if it, it seems, you know, that the, the, the T cells actually are really important. Um, you know, the virus is, the antibodies really are good at stopping, you know, the virus getting into the cell. But once the cell's been infected, then it's the T cells uh, are good. And, and we, you know, we think with many of these, uh, like oculizumab, it doesn't really touch the CD8 response. So, um, you know, that's that's worth thinking about. You know, we may be panicking about the wrong thing, like we've I think potentially done already. Yeah, I think with herpes viruses, I think they've shown that antibody uh, responses to the virus are not the main form of defense. It's mm. definitely CD8 T cells. Mm. So, um, you know, there are even people with VZV immunity where they actually don't have uh, antibodies. But when you do um, cell-based assays, you're looking at spot or looking at proliferative response, they've got extremely brisk uh, uh, T cell responses to the virus without having antibodies. And so um, um, uh, you need to keep in mind that antibodies are just half the equation. I mean, David Wraith in, in, in this webinar the other day said uh, IgA response can be most important. David, do you agree with him? I guess we need to look. I mean, IgA and, um, and IgM responses come up early. I mean, I guess one thing about an IgA response is it's kind of a, a, a mucosal thing. And it, that may be important uh, in trying to stop the virus um, getting into the in, into into the body, um, you know we have lots of uh, ACE two in the gut, for example. So I, I guess we'll find out in in time. Uh, um, I'll keep an open mind. What is your opinion about the use of tocilizumab in MS patients, COVID positive, uh, locally? Immunodulation is an exclusion criteria, or would you suggest only exclusion for it? or ERT and anti-CD20. Dave, you want to answer that question? Well, there's one, one instant, instance of um, somebody on Fingolimod who was treated with, with it, and they did okay. So, um, but I, I, I think the, the issue with the toxilumab is, you know, it's not kind of approved yet. And I think in some cases, it's not, it's not the clear-cut answer that we were kind of told. You know, originally it was, oh, there's a, an IL-6 storm, let's do anti-IL-6 treatment. And... Um, uh, that kind of is still kind of in the mix, you know. I think the problem is is they're treating very sick people with yeah. these agents, and and some of them will kind of die uh, because you know that's they've got you know they're very sick, and and therefore sometimes it, it gives you a worry that if you you're treating people and then they're dying, and it might not be because of the, the treatment uh, kind of making it worse. It might be just that that's that's the event. So. It's difficult to know, I think. Oh, there's, uh, quite a few, there's quite a few trials going on. I think there's about three tocilizumab trials going on. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, whether, but, whether the, the, yeah, but the point about those trials, David, I mean, you make the point that these patients are really ill. It's probably after the, it's probably too late. To be honest yeah. With you. I mean, you know, if we can, if we look in the data coming out, say from New York, uh, of the people that went on to ventilators, it, you know, the, the mortality rate was quite very high, you know, and, and, and really I think, what we really need to be doing as a community, you know, a community is finding antivirals that can be treated when people first um, get symptoms. Unfortunately, uh, it's not really until you get to hospital that you're actually getting treated and of which time you, your virus has been uh, evading the immune system for a long time. So I think that probably is somewhere we could, we could make uh, some inroads. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see as the trials um, read out. So there has been a several um, cohorts published. I mean, they're just descriptive of these are rheumatology patients uh, with RA mainly. 
Sure. Some of them are on anti-TNFs, some of them are on tocilizumab, yeah. and there's quite a few that have been on JAK inhibitors. Mm. And uh, remarkably, they do very well. Um, you know, they, they're not doing badly. So yeah. I think the RA and the rheumatology patients are supporting what we're seeing in MS, that despite being on immunomodulatory, immunosuppressive therapy, um, these patients are doing okay, uh, which means that their antiviral responses are probably fine. Uh, and maybe the immunosuppression is helping uh, prevent or at least mm. uh, um, uh, protect them against severe COVID-19. And I think that uh, is the message not only in uh, autoimmune diseases, but probably in the transplant uh, literature as well. The exception mm. being the patients with ATG, antithymocyte globulin, they had a high mortality, about a 30% mortality. And I suspect ATG takes your T cells down to almost zero. Mm. Um, and you do need some T cells to kill the virus. If you don't have any T cells, you're in trouble. Uh, but we don't use ATG much in MS. I mean, uh, you know, so I don't think we have to worry about it. Are any of the tri do any of the HECT protocols still use ATG, David? Uh, I think they do. Um, I think that I think also with some of those transplants, there was also a, a study from Spain where they didn't actually find such a high mortality rate. Now I'm not 100% sure whether that was um, an ATG uh, component, but I know some of the early fears in the transplant thing weren't replicated when 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 the uh, you know epidemic hit, hit Spain. So um, I guess you know I think. What has to happen is it's like the the weight of data will um, will 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 tell us exactly what happens, and obviously the countries that were infected first have you know the, the greatest number of patients and the greatest number of uh, um, you know kind of in, greatest insight. But of course, you know it, it depends on how the publication system is working, it, how quickly it it can get online. You know, it could be a day or it could be months, depending on. How, how the individuals decide to publish the information. So uh, I guess we're getting to the stage now where there's a lot more um, um, case reports coming out. There was another one on um, arthritis uh, again yesterday, uh, again saying the same type of feature is that, you know, our original fears about um, the immunosuppressives aren't kind of uh, being realized. And I think that may be because the, the biology of the pathology isn't necessarily the immune system that we, we originally thought. Okay, I think we should probably get one last question, David. You reviewed that paper from Poland, you know, the Mantanin paper. <laughs> what is your opinion about a Mantanin in COVID-19? I mean, it's... Uh, well, I guess the question is, is, is the truth will be out. And, um, you know, the, 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 there was another paper actually in Parkinson's, believe it or not, um, again, written in, in Polish. Um, so, so the idea here is, is that amantadine is an antiviral, uh, or potentially it's, it, it was an antiviral. It was, it was used against influenza A. So, you know, the question is, is do people who take uh, amantadine uh, benefit? And, and at, at the end of the day, you put the information out and the registries should be able to actually give, give you an insight into that. Because again, the demographics of people who are probably taking amantadine are probably the people who will be suffering the most at the hands of uh, COVID-19. And I guess that's, we'll find out there. And I think, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think it's a false positive signal. And the reason why I say that, I think it's, it's antiviral yeah. action was based on yeah. a neuraminidase neuro mechanism, yeah. which is specific to flu. It's got nothing to do with coronavirus. So yeah. I, mean, I have no idea how amantadine, it's anti-flu uh, activity against one subtype of flu. Yeah. Is going to translate to coronavirus. Well, I, th I think I think that's true of probably half the things that we're actually we testing in 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 in, uh, in 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 COVID. You know, if if we go back a month ago, uh, ACE inhibitors were like the absolute no no um, because they were supposedly increasing the ACE two receptor, and there and then kind of the whole mindset. So we did all these studies and actually found actually they don't make that much difference. Or if anything, they may maybe make it better. So it's how you understand the biology um, will then dictate what, what becomes uh, fact and what becomes fallacy. And there'll be lots of fallacy. <laughs> well, I mean, the one that got licensed, remdesivir, I mean, that is based on true biology because it was actually tested out against the, um, was, it, was it MERS? Um, but around the protease. And so, you know, mm. it's actually based on proper biology around the, the coronaviruses. But I mean, whether or not that's going to be uh, um, um, proven to be effective is difficult because the first two studies were 
not not positive, mm. and it was only the the third study that was uh, positive. Mm. Okay, Sarah, I think we should probably call it today. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much, David, and thank you, Gavin.